Hello, welcome to some video notes from Topic 1. This is Topic 1.5, where we're going to go through all of the experiments and uh, physical reactions and chemical reactions that supports the idea of um, the origins of cells. And so one of the things that you probably remember earlier on when we talked about the cell theory, this idea that cells come from pre-existing cells uh, becomes a little complicated because if we say that all cells have to come from a cell that already existed, then where did the original cells come from? Uh, and so that's something we still actually don't have uh, a clear picture about. However, we do have ideas about how different parts of a cell uh, would have formed naturally by themselves without having a living thing having to be present for it to occur. And so we're going to talk about uh, where we're getting evidence for this idea of that living things have to come from other living things, and uh, we'll talk about some of the ways that uh, these parts of a cell could have developed over time. You shall not pass! So we'll be going over all of the 1.5 uh, learning objectives in this single set of notes. It will be a little bit longer than some of the ones we've had. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, how we know that cells have to be dividing from pre-existing cells, and we'll be talking about some of the evidence that we have for where pre-existing cells must have formed over time or where their parts must have formed. And uh, of course, there will be talking about some important experiments like Pasteur's experiment and uh, some other ones uh, looking at uh, how the formation of these early molecules probably uh, occurred, the biological molecules. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is Louis Pasteur, the French scientist's um, creation of basically pasteurization. And uh, his first experiment, the, the experiment that first showed a really strong supporting evidence against spontaneous generation. And so for a long time, spontaneous generation was this believed theory that if we mix the right type of non-living things together, uh, we could just spontaneously make a living thing under the right condition. So there used to be a spontaneous generation theory that if I take a, a bowl or like a, a big pot um, and I put some uh, dirty clothes inside and some wheat inside and I put it in a dark place and I leave it there for a week. Uh, if I wait long enough, uh, a mouse will just magically form out of that material. Uh, and so people used to think, well, there's a recipe for growing mice and so there must be a recipe for growing all living things. Uh, this, of course, is not true. What you actually did is that you put you know, scented material that uh, is food for a mouse inside of a container in a dark space where it is not going to be disturbed. Eventually the mouse smells it, climbs inside, eats the wheat, eats the clothing, you know, because it needs food as it's stuck inside this container and it can't climb back out. And then you show up a week later and you look inside and hello, now there's a mouse, uh, but all the other materials are gone because the mouse already ate them. So obviously, we understand that's exactly what would have probably happened. However, before this, people had a hard time explaining why living things seemed to decompose when they died or why, you know, dead material like meat or cheeses would go bad, even though you'd keep them in a location that was cool and dry and away from, the, from light. Uh, what was the factors that were contributing to this? So they didn't really quite understand where living things came from exactly, particularly bacteria uh, or microbes, the things that are too small uh, for a microscope, to, unless you have a microscope to see. So Louis Pasteur, uh, basically, uh, if you've ever consumed milk, uh, it, you are able to drink milk because of pasteurization. So it's named after him, and it's this revolutionary technique of using specific temperatures and pressures in order to sterilize a solution, to remove all living things from that solution. So when you're drinking milk, it's been pasteurized. They've, all bacteria that might have existed in that milk have been killed through the pasteurization method. This means that the milk can last longer because there's less bacteria inside that are gonna start growing in it and making it go bad. And um, that also means that you're less likely to get sick because you're not drinking you know, bacteria, a whole bunch of bacteria with your milk. So, uh, but the other thing was with his experiment, as he was developing the technique for pasteurization, he also gave a lot of evidence that, uh, that uh, living things can only really come from other living things that have existed in the same area. And so on the next slide, we're going to run through the animation going through his experiment. And so you might have to watch it a couple times to help you uh, to understand it. And uh, when you're ready, then you can move on and I'll, I'll summarize it in the next bit.
procedure to test whether sterile nutrient broth could spontaneously generate microbial life. To do this, he set up two experiments. In both, Pasteur added nutrient broth to flasks, bent the necks of the flasks into S-shapes, and then boiled the broth to kill any existing microbes. If left undisturbed, will the broth in these flasks become cloudy with microbial growth? Click on the correct answer. After the broth had been sterilized, Pasteur broke off the swan necks from some of the flasks, exposing the nutrient broth within them to air from above. The remaining flasks were left intact. What do you predict will happen to the broth in the flask on the left? Click on the correct answer. Over time, dust particles from the air fell into the broken flasks, but in the intact flasks, dust particles remained near the tip of the swan necks. They were unable to travel against gravity into the flasks. The broth in the broken flasks quickly became cloudy, a sign that it teemed with microbial life. However, the broth in the unbroken flasks remained clear. Without the introduction of dust, on which microbes can travel, no life arose. Pasteur thus refuted the notion of spontaneous generation. So, just kind of summarize what it is his experiment was. So he was designing the experiment basically trying to create, um, determine whether sterile broth could allow spontaneous generation of microbial life. So could bacteria just magically appear in a solution that bacteria grow very well in um, if it was sterilized first. And so this method actually is fairly quite simple. So he set up two experiments. Right, and he had these special S-shaped or swan-shaped flasks, right? And you saw in the video, they have a very particular shape. And so the flasks, the way they're shaped, would prevent bacteria in the air from really getting up into the flask and down into the medium. And so then what he did is that he boiled both of the flasks, right? These two experiments that he set up. And so the broth being boiled uh, should have been raised to temperatures too high for bacteria inside uh, when he made them uh, to survive. And so all the bacteria should have been killed, which would sterilize the medium. Now, if he just left them there uh, for a really long time, uh, bacteria would not grow on the medium because bacteria couldn't get to the medium, or the nutrient broth that's on the inside. So they wouldn't be able to use it to grow and to break it down and, and it wouldn't become contaminated. In fact, I believe if you go to the Louis Pasteur Museum, uh, somewhere, I think it's somewhere in Paris, uh, you can still see some of these original flasks that still haven't been opened yet and uh, are still sterile. So the medium inside is still clean of bacteria. Um, anyway, and so to test that, well, you need to be exposed to bacteria for new bacteria to start to exist. He then took one of them and he broke the neck off. And so the broken section of the neck was then exposed to air because the S-shape uh, flask part was removed and it was quite easy for the bacteria in the air to get down into the medium. And then he would see uh, that the one that he left alone was fine, but the one that he had broken the neck uh, of would get really cloudy. And uh, if you looked at it, he would see that there was a bunch of bacteria that were growing inside and as they were living off of that medium. So this indicates that that uh, you need an exposure of, of bacteria to the growth medium to get more bacteria to appear and to use this medium. So this helped to reject the idea of spontaneous generation. So we couldn't really have microbes showing up in this medium, this nutrient inside the broth, unless the other microbes from the environment were first introduced to it. And so this helped support this idea that life doesn't really come from a bunch of random stuff put together uh, in, in the right condition. It actually has to come from other living things producing those living things. So this really comes to uh, was he correct about this, uh, that life has never occurred from spontaneous generation, some spontaneous generation now? And we've already kind of leading into this. It's that, well, as we know that life now doesn't come from spontaneous generation. However, life must have come from some point at spontaneous generation, right? There must have been an original cell or original cells that, you know, all living things eventually would have come from. And so we can get into, well, where would those original parts of the cells going to, where would they be forming from uh, in the early, early forms of Earth before there was life?
So if you remember from our cell theory, we stated that all living things have to be comprised of cells, at least a cell. So that means that the smallest unit of a living thing would be a cell. And therefore, all pre-existing cell, all cells have to come from a pre-existing cell. And so that's the one we really want to get into today, this idea of where did the pre-existing cells come from? So we know that we can have an increase in the number of cells through cellular division, which is the part we're going to talk about on 1.6. And so it's not that difficult for a cell to become two cells, and two cells to become four cells, and four cells to become eight cells, and continuing on down that line. Actually reproducing cells, either mitosis or through meiosis, is actually quite an easy process for cells to do. However, uh, where did those original cells come from? And so we have to start thinking about what evidence do we have other than Pasteur's experiment that could help support this theory that living things had to have come from other living things? Are there other things we can notice about cells themselves and about life in general that can help us support this idea? So let's go through a list of things that we know about cells that can help us support this, uh, this theory that life must have come from other living things or living things come from other living things. First off, looking at this image, these are all those parts of the cell, right? All those compartmentalized sections of a cell that these organelles, these ultra structures that do a whole bunch of different roles for the cell, right? So these themselves are a piece of evidence. The fact that cells are highly complex, right? And there's, there's no mechanism has been found to produce something like this, to produce these little machines in some ways, these living machines um, that are parts of a cell. We haven't found anything in the universe that produces something like them besides a living thing. So if we're going to make this complex machine that is a cell and all of the parts inside of the cell that are going to keep the cell functioning, we really need a cell in order to do that because we haven't found anything else that was capable of it at this point. When we take all these cells and we put them together and we start making complex organisms like tissues and organs, so far as we know, there are all, all examples of growth inside of an organism and of tissue layers is all done by cellular division. There is no other way for something to increase in size or increase in the number of cells without those cells going through mitosis, going through cellular division. So that means that if we're going to increase the number of cells, we have to have a starting cell in order to increase the number of that starting cell through division. This here is an image of a virus. And a virus normally is a small ball of a protein coat. So it's not a membrane, this part here, it's actually like a protein layer, it's around it. And on the inside, this purple section, this is normally some type of DNA, some type of RNA, and some enzymes and things that help keep the virus functioning to a certain extent. The interesting thing about viruses is that viruses, they are even more small, they're much smaller and more simple, or simpler, sorry, are simpler than of even a bacterial cell. It's a very, very basic thing. But viruses are not considered to be a living thing. So the thing is, remember our Mr. H. Gren, right? There are properties of a living thing. And some of the properties of a living thing are not present in a virus. For example, the metabolism. Viruses are pretty much always dormant. They don't do anything except after they've taken over a host cell, once they've invaded a cell and used that cell's metabolism in order to help keep it to do something. So it doesn't really have its own metabolism. It steals the metabolism of a cell that it's infected that it's going to eventually kill because that's what viruses do. They infect cells and then eventually kill them through the process of reproduction. Viruses are also incapable of reproducing. If I have the virus here, I could put it in a medium broth, I could make it have all the nutrients it would ever need, and it's never going to reproduce unless I put other cells in that broth as well. So then the hosts, the virus will, uh, will attach to the cell and use it as a host, like a parasite, and eventually use the cell's inner mechanics, its organelles, in order to make copies of the virus and, and therefore go through its reproduction. So since viruses are too simple to have all of the properties of a living thing, once we get below the basic level of a cell, once we get something that's even more simple than the simplest of cells, we don't have a living thing. We don't have all of those properties that define what a living thing is. So viruses are an example of what happens if we don't have all of the parts of a cell, uh, we don't still have a living thing. It can look like a cell. We think it, in some ways it kind of acts like a cell, but it doesn't have all the properties of a living thing because it's not alive.
And the last and probably most solid piece of evidence that living things have to be coming from other living things is the genetic code, our DNA. So we're going to spend a lot of time in topic two talking about how DNA creates proteins, which keep your body alive and keep your cells alive, and how amazing DNA is as a molecule. But the thing is, is DNA is universal. All living things use the same bases, A, T, C, and G, when they make DNA. All DNA, or so all RNA in the universe that we've ever found, or on Earth, you know, uh, uses A, G, C, and U, right? So they don't use T, but they use U. So it's always using the same materials. And then also they create a 64 codon network, right? So we take, oops, let's take that. We take three codons or three pieces of DNA, three bases, and we use it in sections that we call a codon. And there are 64 codons that exist. And those 64 codons are how the cell knows which amino acid it should be using when it makes a protein. So not only is how DNA is built the same, how RNA is built is the same, but the codon, the special decoding system that a cell uses in order to turn DNA into amino acids, that's all exactly the same too. So we can logic that if all living things are using the same building materials in the same way, under the same rules, and on even the same code, because really the code can be interpreted in any number of ways. You know, there's no rule saying you have to use the codons this way. But yet, every living thing uses them exactly the same way. So that helps indicate that we must be connected to each other in some way. All right, because we're all, um, you know, it, it would be highly unlikely that uh, all these living things would have various ways of storing their information or various ways of storing proteins uh, if they were all connected to each other from the same origin, from the same beginning point of life. So, if we're going to say that all of life has to come from living things, we get into this problem of how did the first cells arise from non-living material? So we have to either think of it in two ways. Either non-living things created the first cells through some natural processes, right? So we had the first cells arising from non-living material. Or somewhere else in the universe, life existed under some other circumstances that we don't quite understand. And the very first cells landed on Earth, maybe on a meteor or some asteroid hitting the Earth. And so those original cells survived the trip through space, survived crashing on the surface of the Earth. And then it's basically like the bacteria being added to the broth in um, Pasteur's experiment. The bacteria, the early cells having all these nutrients on Earth, uh, they just spread like crazy. And eventually from there, all of life evolved. Uh, either one of these are possible, how it's a little bit more uh, difficult to imagine that life came from an asteroid that had cells on it. Maybe a little, a little bit more likely that non-living material eventually created a cell. So then we have some problems we have to eventually solve. If non-living things came from, if cells, sorry, came from non-living things, we have to figure out how do we deal with the idea of non-living synthesis, right? So we make these large organic molecules like our carbohydrates and our proteins and our DNA. And uh, how, how did they form? How did a phospholipid form without something to make the phospholipid? Modern cells, like the cells you have inside of your body, they make phospholipids, right? They construct them to make sure that you can continue to grow. So how did phospholipid, how did the first membrane form without anything alive in order to make the first phospholipids? How did we assemble polymers? Once we had the basic building blocks, like a single phospholipid or a single sugar or a single amino acid, how did we eventually create large proteins and large complex sugar structures? How did we get the concept of self-replicating? Where did the idea of making copies of something come from? So even after we created the first proteins, where did the first enzymes come from? Where did the first use of DNA come from? Where was the rule set down that this is how we will take genetic information and copy it and give it to another cell so that we're all identical to each other? So where did the first cell division occur? And then, as I said, how did membranes form? Right? If we're going to compartmentalize, if we're going to have an inside and an outside, that we can control the inside and adjust to things that happen on the outside, we need a membrane. We need a selective permeable membrane. So where did those first membranes come from? 
So uh, the rest of the PPT, we're going to be going through some experiments and some thought experiments and some actual experiments that go through these different concerns and points evidence into why even with these issues, it's still possible that life came from non-living things at some point. So first, let's adjust or address uh, the formation of simple uh, organic material, right? So, uh, Earth's atmosphere uh, was a reducing in the early days. So right now it's an oxidizing atmosphere because we have lots of oxygen, right? So it can go through lots of oxidation or reactions with oxygen. However, uh, early atmosphere, as far as we can tell, uh, the early atmosphere on Earth did not have a lot of oxygen gas. There was oxygen, right? There was a lot of water. Water has oxygen in it. But there was not a lot of O2. There was, however, a lot of other compounds, a lot of other gases that are really good at re going through reductions, not really oxidation, but going through reduction. So do you think you can identify these from your experiences with chemistry? So why don't you pause the video and see if you can identify what were the gases that made up the atmosphere of early Earth before life existed? All right, just take a guess. All right, so our early gases, as far as we can tell, would have been abundant, we would have had hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, water vapor, methane, ammonia, and hydrosulfuric acid, or hydrosulfide, sorry. So these here are our major gases that the atmosphere was going to be made of before you know life really started to exist. It's actually through photosynthesis, all right, the evolution of organic of, of living things being able to do photosynthesis to turn light into organic material to build their own sugars and fats and proteins using light as an energy source. That's where oxygen gas, O2, was first created. And so the abundance of life, of living things doing photosynthesis over many millions of years is the reason why we have an oxygen-rich environment right now. And so other living things like us adapted to using oxygen as a good way to get energy out of organic material. And so now life is dependent on oxygen, right? So oxygen gas didn't really exist in high numbers before, but it does now because of life. Life has changed uh, the atmosphere on Earth. So if these were the essential materials or in, in the atmosphere, these are the essential gases, right? Could we build simple organic material like sugars and amino acids from these materials without any living things? And so what we're going to do is look at the experiment where we had what we call the primordial soup. And so the primordial soup is basically the early versions of the oceans, early oceans on Earth. And so we knew Earth had a lot of water, has always had a lot of water for a good amount of time. And we're going to think about how did this primordial soup come about? How did it produce the, uh, the very first organic molecules? And so back in 1953, there was a lab that was done by Miller and Ure. And so Miller and Ure, basically wanted to look at what he, they called chemical evolution. Could organic material, right, organic compounds, come from inorganic material, inorganic compounds, like the ones we just listed before, given the right circumstances? And so they thought, okay, if we take these gases, right, the nitrogen gas, the sulfide gases, the carbon dioxide, the methane, the water vapor, if we mix them together inside a container, we need to represent um, a chemical reaction. So we need an abundant amount of energy in order to cause a chemical reaction. These compounds are quite stable, and if they're going to break apart and then reform some other new process, new compound, they're going to need energy to drive that chemical reaction. Well, most likely, this would have come from uh, lightning moving through the early atmosphere, or maybe uh, heat coming from volcanic activity, so boiling water or high-temperatured water uh, uh, coming from volcanic activity underneath uh, the ocean. Either one of them are a possibility. We do know that early forms of life, or early, sorry, not life, but early versions of the Earth before life existed was very volcanically active, so there was lots of eruptions, a lot of uh, volcanic activity occurring, a lot of earthquakes. There are also huge storms, lots of lightning would have been generated by all the material being thrown up into the air by the volcanic activity as well. So 
<laughs> they decided to generate an experiment to see whether or not they could essentially grow organic material under these early conditions. And so what they did is they took a flask, sorry, a sealed container, all right, uh, and inside it, they had the early versions of the ocean. So they had dissolved versions of water, it's methane and, and um, um, nitrogen containing gases and uh, ammonia and hydrogen gas. And they used a heat source to kind of, you know, boil this material and transfer it from a water in, or sorry, liquid into a gas. And so then this gas traveled up through a tube into a, a chamber. And inside this chamber, in the gas form, right, well, that's where they think that they had enough energy to, to do this chemical reaction, they gave that extra spark of energy needed to do the chemi chemistry through uh, a little spark of electricity to represent lightning that would have existed in the atmosphere. And so then they zapped this gas, this vapor of mixing of different gases, different organic material, or inor sorry, inorganic material, and then um, the gas was cooled through a condenser so that it, it would condense back into a liquid. And so then the liquid started to just, you know, pile up here on the bottom and it was able to like be separated, right? So it's kind of separated in some way from the original container. And then from here they could take samples. And so when they took samples of this material, they found that inside the fluid that was produced from this experiment, they had actually found many naturally occurring amino acids. So they were able to build the things that would be needed to make proteins. And proteins, therefore, can then do chemical reactions, right? That can keep a cell alive uh, without needing any living things. All they needed was some early versions of the atmosphere and some lightning. And they were able to just through natural chemical forces create organic material that life could be built from. So after a week of just kind of letting this material run through this course, it looked like this. And so this brown gunky material that's on the inside here, right? That's all that's all different organic materials that are all building up including 13 to 20 different naturally occurring, so 13 of the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. And that was only a single experiment. So they could repeat this experiment with different concentrations of the different gases. And from there, they're able to produce other organic materials like lipids and sugars and other types of amino acids as well. So this really kind of helped show that these, this complex organic structure, this thing that we think only cells can actually produce, actually can be made uh, by a non-living thing, um, by the environment. You just need the right ingredients and the right condition. So it is possible that the simple organic material that life is built from could be made without any living things being present. So if we're going to run through this, you should be able to explain the experiment as a series of steps, right? Something you show up on a test. So you should be able to say that under the conditions of a reducing atmosphere, that's a key word, right? Or very low oxygen. They used high, you can use a high radiation level, higher temperatures or an electrical storm, something to put a lot of energy into these compounds, right? So what they did is they take water containing these compounds and they boil it to create a vapor where we have ammonia, a methane, hydrogen gases, water vapor, right? And then if they use lightning to trigger the stimulation, like a spark of lightning, I'm sorry, spark to stimulate the idea of lightning, getting my words mixed up, and then allow that mixture to cool, after about a week, they're able to create simple amino acids and even some complex oily hydrocarbons. So they're able to make uh, fats and lipids as well, right? So because of this, they're able to show that prebiotic earth, earth before there were living things, organic compounds, the things that build a living thing, could have been formed naturally without having uh, a living thing needing to exist in order to make them. All right, so then you should be able to, you know, very... Uh, clearly run through the steps of the experiment and explain what it showed. So the next thing we need to think about, okay, so the first concern was could we build simple organic material? And so then the next one was how do we build complex organic material or polymers? How do we build giant chains of sugars and whole proteins out of simple amino acids and whole big uh, uh, fats and lipids out of really simple 
uh, oily hydrocarbons. So we take that experiment and we extend it even further. All right, so the formation of amino acids, but the conditions maybe aren't exactly right for the creation of hydrolyzed bonds, which might prevent polymers from forming. So if we had deep sea vents, though, we could have under the right amount of pressure and the right temperatures be kind of continuously boiling this material, right? So in their experiment, that kind of allowed the material to cool down, and it's kind of not really reactive very much anymore. However, if we continued to heat it under really high temperatures and relatively high pressure, like we see at the bottom of the ocean, where geothermal vents right, are going to heat the water because the volcanic material, the magma, is very close to the water, and so it's kind of boiling the water, even though it's at the bottom of the ocean. And so this very, very active um, area, right, because there's lots of uh, high temperatures, could give the energy necessary to take those uh, reduced inorganic compounds and help them form into more complex organic polymers. So we could take these materials, these simple materials, and form complex organic polymers, but again, we need the right condition, right? So we'd have to continue to form these simple building blocks and then put them under the right conditions so that they can fuse together to create even larger polymers. So the third one was the idea of self-replication. So how did we find something that could be inherited, could be passed from one cell to another? It's great if we have a cell, it's great if we have a million cells. But if those cells don't reproduce and then take their information, their DNA, and pass it on to the next living thing, right, their offspring, then life eventually ends when those things die. And there's actually a really high probability that life was created or a living thing was created thousands or hundreds of thousands of times before it actually became a living thing that could go through replication accurately to the point that it stuck and that it became a permanent living thing that existed on Earth and was able to, you know, eventually evolve into other forms of life. So the thing is that DNA, as we know it now, is extremely stable and it's very good at storing information. And the thing is, though, even though it's super stable and really good at storing your genetic information, the information that makes your cells look like they do and do what they do, it actually cannot self-replicate. It needs enzymes to replicate, right? Lots of different enzymes. And enzymes are made out of proteins. So how is DNA going to be this inheritable genetic information, this inheritable molecule, when it itself can't make copies of itself? It needs another thing. It needs proteins in order to make copies of itself. However, early forms of life probably didn't use DNA. They probably used RNA. And that's the reason why we think they used RNA, because RNA actually can store information and it can self-replicate. RNA can actually act like an enzyme, like proteins do. So RNA being this kind of middle ground between DNA and proteins, probably the earliest forms of life didn't use DNA as their genetic information that would be copied and moved around to other cells when they did cell division. It probably was RNA because RNA can copy itself if it needs to. It has the ability to both store information and self-replicate. The reason why we probably don't use RNA now, though, is because RNA actually mutates a lot, and it's not super stable compared to DNA. DNA is much more stable than RNA. So as life evolved, it became better for living things to be using DNA, a much more stable molecule, to store the information, but then later using RNA and using proteins in order to express that information, in order to build things out of the information that's in DNA in order to make a living thing. So ribosomal RNA, for example, which we'll learn about in topic two, is responsible for building proteins. So if, ribos if RNA existed as a way to store information, then you could take another form of RNA called ribosomal RNA and it could use the information present in order to build proteins and also could be then used to make replications of that RNA and pass it on to another living thing. So this is a newer area of research right now and there isn't a lot more to say about it at least at this level of high school but it is possible that RNA is the, is the key to solving this issue.
And so the last one is actually kind of the easiest one to solve because if the first two are possible, if natural lipids can form, you know, from those inorganic molecules mixing with lightning and going through some rapid chemistry up in the sky and then dissolving down into the oceans, and then high temperatures in the thermal, gents, thermal vents in the oceans and under pressure were able to make more complex protein or more complex lipids like phospholipids, which could occur naturally if, po if under the right circumstances. Well, once phospholipids are formed, they naturally form bilipids by themselves. They actually, we don't need a living thing to create a membrane. We just need the formation of the phospholipids and phospholipids will form this bilipid membrane by themselves because it is the most stable in order to avoid, you know, the hydrophobic regions from getting away from the water and the hydrophilic regions being near the water. So actually the formation under the right conditions, once we have the uh, phospholipids creating uh, membranes, actually not so difficult. So then what we need is this kind of perfect storm of the formation of a membrane around a section of liquid that both has some RNA inside and some maybe early amino acids and organic material inside, some sources of energy inside, and eventually this starts to create a stable structure, our, a pre-cell or a primordial cell, and then from there it can replicate and make a copy of its own RNA and go through the process of cellular division in order to kind of grow a little bit bigger and to be a little bit more stable than it divides itself in half, which we'll get into as 1.6. So, um, yeah, so we just kind of have the right circumstances for all these things to happen, and then we get our first pre-cell, right, our earliest version of a self-replicating system like a cell. Very, very, very simple but possible to stay alive and to continue to go through replication, okay? So again, you this could have happened hundreds of thousands of times over the course of the history of Earth before life actually really started to form. And we do know that after the Earth cooled and the oceans were you know, there and the atmosphere was starting to build up, there were millions and millions of years before life ever seemed to appear on Earth. So that's lots of time for this trial and error process to happen over and over again until eventually you get just the right circumstances. And then once you have one living thing formed and it's stable and it can reproduce, uh, it's it's just going to keep going. It's going to keep growing as long as it has, you know, nutrients and water and space. And early forms of Earth had all of those, had tons of space, tons of nutrients, right? Tons of water around it. And so life, once it got going, really spread out very quickly. All right. I know this has gone on quite a long time. Sorry, we just got one more thing to talk about, and that is our endosymbiotic theory. And so endosymbiotic, so endo is meaning inside, or internal, and symbiotic means a relationship or a connection, normally where both things are benefiting. And so an endosymbiotic theory is here to explain why we have several organelles. Mostly we're going to talk about the uh, mitochondria and the chloroplasts, but these organelles that seem to have some differences between our types of cells and bacterial types of cells. And the summary of it is, so eukaryotic cells are a little bit different from bacteria. We have a nucleus, right? We have membrane-bound organelles where bacteria cells do not. We have larger size ribosomes where bacteria have smaller size ribosomes. Our DNA is in, in long, thin threads where their DNA, bacterial DNA, is in circles, right? And so we have these very specific properties that we find in eukaryotic cells or advanced cells that we don't find in bacterial cells and vice versa. But the interesting thing about mitochondria and chloroplasts inside the eukaryotic cells is that there are more similarities between the mitochondria and the chloroplasts with bacteria, right, with prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, our types of cells. So there's a growing theory, or right, there's a very well-supported theory, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts aren't actually organelles created by the cell. They are actually bacteria that were consumed by early cells. And when they were consumed, rather than breaking them down and using them as a source of food, just like when you eat something, uh, 
they created a symbiotic relationship where the eukaryotic cell basically gave a protection around the bacteria and the bacteria, the early form of what becomes the mitochondria or eventually becomes the chloroplast, kind of agreed to like, okay, you're going to protect me and I'm going to keep doing what I do and I'm going to give you, you know, extra amounts of energy that I don't necessarily need. I'm going to help, we're going to help each other survive. All right, the symbiotic, kind of like a mutualism, right, with our, the birds and the bees, they have a mutual relationship, right? And so through this mutual relationship developing over millions and millions of years, now the mitochondria and the chloroplasts are completely dependent on us, and we are completely dependent on them. If we removed the mitochondria or chloroplasts, uh, eukaryotic cells would not be able to function. And if you took the mitochondria or the chloroplasts out, they themselves would not be able to function. They can't survive outside the eukaryotic cells, and the eukaryotic cells cannot survive without them. So they're completely dependent on each other now. And so we're going to go through the evidence that explains how we think this theory is true. First and foremost, we have to think about the development of internal membranes. And so the early forms of prokaryotes are just like modern prokaryotes. They do not have a nucleus. They just have a nucleoid. They have a, you know, a ball of DNA that's kind of floating around in their cell, and there's no real protection around it. And so what happens probably is cells continue to grow in size. Uh, they have to worry about an efficiency between the surface area and their volume. If their surface area uh, doesn't increase more than their volume, if they get too large, basically, uh, they can no longer maintain homeostasis, right? So we already talked about this earlier in topic one. So to increase the surface area without increasing volume inside of a cell, you could fold the membranes inwards to make compartmentalize, right? To make these little subsections, which help with the surface area to volume ratio. So the internal membranes kind of pinched off inside and eventually formed a kind of protection around the nucleoid. That's where the first nucleus probably came from. And so this is supporting evidence that the internal structures, these internal membranes that we find inside of eukaryotes that are not present in prokaryotes could have evolved from prokaryotes. It could have been a way that early versions of bacteria were kind of adapting themselves in order to, to best be more stable as they increased in size. So then based on the idea that cells can adapt themselves, right? They, they can go through slight changes of their internal structures in order to better survive. We have a situation where we have an early form of this cell that has membranes around the nucleus, and it goes through the steps of the endosymbiotic theory. And so we're gonna go through it step by step. So we have basically an aerobic protobacterium, and it's slightly larger than an anaerobic bacteria, uh, anaerobic prokaryotes, right? And so this um, is basically a, some type of prey or, or some type of parasite. And so this, um, this guy here, this early form of a mitochondria, it can, can use oxygen to do anaerobic respiration, right? So it can make lots and lots of oxygen. It's very stable. Where this guy, the one that's eating it, is anaerobic. It does not get very much energy out of nutrition because it cannot do anaerobic or aerobic respiration and it only can do anaerobic respiration. So it would be beneficial to this one to use the anaerobic bacteria as a source of energy because the anaerobic bacteria will make way more energy than the, so the aerobic bacteria will make way more energy than the anaerobic bacteria. So as it engulfs it, it's much larger, right? It's big and stable because it has the, these internal membranes to help keep it nice and stable. And as it enlarges it, uh, it either they try to digest it and it doesn't work, or maybe they don't digest it at all, but eventually it becomes an endosymbiont. It becomes kind of joined with the cell and they agree to work together in some way. So the aerobic bacteria that's inside the larger bacteria cell is protected from the environment, so it's gaining something. And the host cell is going to get a lot of extra ATP. It's going to get a lot of energy from the aerobic bacteria because the aerobic bacteria can produce more energy than it can. And so both of them are able to survive with each other until eventually they grow into a new structure where we have what we would call a pre-eukaryotic cell, right? a larger complex cell. And we have a mitochondria 
right? And so this whole process would have been how a mitochondria would have formed, and we would assume that the exact same thing could happen with a cyanobacterium uh, creating our first chloroplast. And so this kind of ingestion of a bacteria into another bacteria that's much larger, uh, and then forming kind of a relationship where they both benefit from each other existing uh, is where we would imagine these, um, this uh, endosymbiotic theory forming. So here's a quick review of endosymbiosis. You can see we have an ancestral prokaryotic cell that has DNA in the middle and a cell wall on the outside. There's no nucleus. So over time, the membrane infolds, eventually becoming the endoplasmic reticulum, and as it infolds around the, nu the DNA, it becomes the nucleus. The eukaryotic cell developed more organelles because it began to absorb simpler uh, prokaryotic cells. That's infoldings of primitive cells. So eventually, here comes a bacterium that gets swallowed up by the cell, and the bacterium, over time, becomes a membrane-bound organelle that we know is the mitochondria. This happens over millions of years. Uh, likewise, oh, here's a picture, electron micrograph coming up of the mitochondria. There it is, beautifully. So over time, we had uh, some prokaryotes that had chloroplasts in there. This is a photosynthetic bacteria. This was also absorbed by eukaryotic cells millions of years ago to become organelles that we call chloroplasts. So this is a review, a quick review of endosymbiosis. So this sounds like a great theory. Uh, obviously the mechanics are possible, but then where is the evidence? So how do we know that mitochondria and chloroplasts are actually more similar to bacteria than eukaryotes are? Well, looking at some of the characteristics, mitochondria and bacteria, as our mitochondria and chloroplasts and bacteria all have their own DNA. Even though you have DNA inside of your nucleus, every one of your mitochondria has its own DNA, and it's the only part of your cells that have their own DNA. And it is circular and not st stuck with any proteins, which is very similar to how bacteria have their DNA. There are ribosomes inside mitochondria and chloroplasts, and they are small ribosomes called 70S ribosomes, which are the types of ribosomes which would be present inside of bacterial cells. So the ribosomes are both present in mitochondria and chloroplasts, and they're both the same type of ribosomes that bacteria cells have. They have a double membrane, just like the um, uh, prokaryotes, right? So they have a, a two-layered membrane, which is what you'd see inside a prokaryote, and your mitochondria and your chloroplasts have two-layered membrane as well. They're about the same size. Mitochondria and, and chloroplasts are roughly you know, the same diameters of what we would see for um, bacterial cells. Uh, they transcribe their DNA and use mRNA to make their own proteins. So even though your DNA inside of your nucleus is used to make proteins to keep your cells alive, mitochondria, they have their own DNA, they have their own ribosomes, and they make their own proteins. So they have their own functioning system by themselves as almost if they had adapted at one point to be completely independent from you or from the eukaryotic cells. The same thing goes for the chloroplasts. And during division, which we'll talk about in 1.6, the nucleus and all the organelles are going to be divided and separated uh, when the cell goes through cellular division. However, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts uh, divide themselves. They don't have to follow the same division uh, rules that the rest of the cell follows. So they are capable of going through their own division different from the rest of the cell. So all of this evidence put together is really, really getting this endosymbiotic theory. All right, so I know this was a really long one, sorry, but we covered a whole section of the topic here in just one video. And if you have any questions, let me know.